On the day of my move to the Hopkins Park Plaza, I wake up savoring the thought of the perishables I'm going to stock my refrigerator with. Mayonnaise, mustard, chicken breasts. But when I get there, Hildy is gone and the woman in the towering bee black beehive, who has taken her place, says I didn't understand. The room won't be available until next week, and I should call first to be sure. Had I really been so befogged by the wishful thinking that I'd misunderstood what had seemed to be a fairly detailed arrangement? Bring your money down at nine on Saturday, you can move in at four, etc. Or had someone else just beat me to it? Never mind. I've been clear-headed enough to know all along that the Park Plaza apartment with kitchenette at $179 a week was not a long-term option on Walmart's $7 an hour. My plan had been to add a weekend job, which I have been tentatively offered at a rainbow supermarket near the apartment where I originally stayed, at close to $8 an hour. Between the two jobs, I would be making about $320 a week after taxes, so that the $179 in rent would have amounted to about 55% of my income, which is beginning to look affordable. But rainbow also falls through. They decide me to work part-time five days a week, not just on weekends. Furthermore, I have no control at the moment over what my days off will be. Howard has scheduled me to have Friday off one week, Tuesday and Wednesday the next, and I would have to do some serious sucking up to arrive at a more stable and congenial schedule. Ergo, I either need to find a husband like Melissa or a second job, like some of my other co-workers. In the long run, everything will work out if I demote my mornings to job hunting, while holding out for a park plaza opening or, better yet, a legitimate apartment at $400 a month or $100 a week. But to paraphrase Kenny's, in the long run, we'll all be broke, at least those of us who work for low wages and live in exorbitantly overpriced motels. I call the YWCA to see whether they have any rooms, and they refer me to a place called Budget Lodging, which doesn't have any rooms either, although they do have dorm beds for $19 a night. I can have my own locker, and there's no lockout in the morning. You can hang out in your dorm bed all day if you want. Even with these enticements, I have to admit I'm relieved when the guy at Budget Lodging tells me they're located on the other side of Minneapolis so I can rule out the dorm on account of the drive and the gas costs, at least as long as I'm working at Walmart. Maybe I should have just dumped Walmart, moved into the dorm, and relaunched my job search from there. But the truth is, I'm not ready to leave Walmart yet. It's my connection to the world, my source of identity, my place. The budget lodging clerk, who seems to have some familiarity with the housing nightmares of low-wage workers, Suggests so I keep trying with towels. He's sure there must be some that cost less than $240 a week. In the meantime, the Clearview Inn wants an unconscionable $55 for any additional nights there, which means that, for a couple of nights, almost any motel would be preferable. I call Caroline to ask for her insights into the housing situation and... I should have guessed this was coming. She calls back in a few minutes to invite me to move in with her and her family. I say no. I've already had a stint of free lodging. And now I have to take my chances with the market like anyone else. But for a moment, I get this touched by an angel feeling I'd gotten from Melissa's sandwich. I'm not really entirely alone. I start calling around to motels again now ranging even farther out from the city into the northern towns, the western town, St. Paul. But most have no rooms at all, at any price, either now or for the coming weeks. Because of the season, I'm told, although it's hard to see why a place like, say, Clearview, Minnesota, would be a destination at any time of the year. Only the Comfort Inn has a room available at forty nine ninety five a night. So I, <clears throat> so I make a reservation there for a couple of days. The relief I feel about leaving the worst motel in the country is canceled by an overwhelming sense of defeat. Could I have done better? 
the St. Paul Pioneer Press of June 13th, which I eagerly snatch out of the box in front of the Walmart, provides an overdue reality check. Apartment rents skyrocket, the front page headline declares. We've leaped 20.5% in Minneapolis the first three months of 2000 alone, an unprecedented increase, according to local real estate experts. Even more pertinent to my condition, the Twin Cities region is posting one of the lowest vacancy rates in the nation, possibly the lowest. Who knew? My cursory pre-tip research had revealed nothing about a record absence of housing. In fact, I'd come across articles bemoaning the absence of a TwinCities.com industry, and these had led me to believe that the region had been spared the wild real estate inflation afflicting, for example, California's Bay Area. But apparently, you don't need .com wealth to ruin an area for its low-income residents. The Pioneer Press quotes Secretary of HUD Andrew Camo, ruining the cruel irony that prosperity is shrinking the stock of affordable housing nationwide. The stronger the economy, the stronger the upward pressure on rents. So I'm a victim not of poverty, but of prosperity? The rich and the poor who are generally thought to live in a state of harmonious interdependence, the one providing cheap labor, the other providing low-wage jobs, can no longer coexist. I check in at the Comfort Inn in the firm expectation that this will be only for a night or two before something, somewhere, opens up to me. What I cannot know is that this is, in some sense, my moment of final defeat. Game over. End of story. At least, if it's a story about attempting to match earnings to rent. In almost three weeks, I've spent over $500 and earned only $42. From Walmart for orientation night. There's more coming eventually. Walmart, like so many other low-wage employers, holds back your first week's pay. But eventually, will be too late. So, anyway, begins my surreal existence at the Comfort Inn. I live in luxury with AC, a door that bolts, a large window protected by an intact screen, just like a tourist or a business traveler. From there I go out every day to a life that most business travelers would find shabby and dispiriting. Lunch at Wendy's, dinner at Sabaro, the Italian favorite fast food place, and work at Walmart, where I would be embarrassed to be discovered in my vest should some member of the comfort staff happen to wander in. Of course, I expect to leave any day when the Hopkins Park Plaza opens up. For the time being, though, I revel in the splendor of my accommodations, amazed that they cost $5 less on a daily balance than what I was paying for that rat hole in Clearview. I stop worrying about my computer being stolen or cooked. I sleep through the night. The sick little plucking habit loses its grip. I feel like the man in the commercials for the Holiday Inn Express who's so refreshed by his overnight stay that he can perform a surgery in the next day or instruct people on how to use a parachute. At Walmart, I get better at what I do, much better than I could have ever imagined at the beginning. The breakthrough comes on a Saturday, one of your heavier shopping days. There are two carts waiting for me when I arrive at two and tossed items inches deep on major patches of the floor. The place hasn't been shopped, it's been looted. In this situation, all I can do is everything at once. Stoop, reach, bend, lift, run from rack to rack with my cart. And then it happens. A magical flow state in which the clothes start putting themselves away. Oh, I play a part in this, but not in any conscious way. Instead of thinking, white stag, navy twill squirt, and dodgily searching out similar squirts, all I have to do is form an image of the item in my mind, transpose this image onto the visual field and move to wherever the image finds its match in the outer world. I don't know how this works. Maybe my mind just gets so busy processing the incoming visual data that it has to bypass the left brain's verbal centers with their cumbersome instructions. Proceed to White Stag area in the northwest corner of ladies. Try bottom rack near khaki shorts. Or maybe the trick lies in understanding that each item wants to be reunited with its sibs and its clan members in that, 
within each clan, the item wants to occupy its proper place in the color size hierarchy. Once I let the clothes take charge, once I understand that I am the only means of their reunification, they just fly out of the cart to their natural homes. On the same day, perhaps because the new speediness frees me to think more clearly, I make my peace with the customers and discover the purpose of life, or at least of my life at Walmart. Management may think that the purpose is to sell things, but this is an overly reductionist, narrowly capitalist view. As a matter of fact, I never see anything sold since sales take place out of my sight at the cash registers at the front of the store. All I see is customers unfolding carefully folded t-shirts, taking dresses and pants off their hangers, holding them up for a moment's idle inspection, then dropping them somewhere for us associates to pick up. For me, the way out of resentment begins with a clue provided by a poster near the break room in the back of the store where only associates go. Your mother doesn't work here, it says. Please pick up after yourself. I've passed it many times thinking, ha, that's all I do, pick up after people. Then it hits me. Most of the people I pick up after are mothers themselves, meaning that what I do at work is what they do at home. Pick up the toys and the clothes and the spills. So the great thing about shopping, for most of these women, is that here they get to behave like brats, ignoring the bawling babies in their carts, tossing things around for someone else to pick up. And it wouldn't be any fun, would it? Unless the clothes were all reasonably orderly to begin with, which is where I come in, constantly recreating orderliness for the customers to maliciously destroy. It's appalling, but it's in their nature. Only pristine and virginal displays truly excite them. I test this theory out on Isabel, that our job is to constantly recreate the stage setting in which women can act out. That without us, rates of child abuse would suddenly soar. That we function in a way as therapists and should probably be paid accordingly at 50 to to $100 an hour. You just go on thinking that. She says, shaking her head. But she smiles her canny little smile in a way that makes me think it's not a bad notion. With competence comes a new impatience. Why does anybody put up with the wages we're paid? True, most of my fellow workers are better cushioned than I am. They live with spouses or grown children, or they have other jobs in addition to this one. I sit with Lynn in the break room one night and find out this is the only part-time job for her six hours a day, with other eight hours spent at a factory for nine dollars an hour. Doesn't she get awfully tired? Nah, it's what she's always done. The cook at the radio grill has two other jobs. You might expect a bit of grumbling, some signs here and there of unrest, graffiti on the horatory posters in the break room, muffled gaffles during our associates meeting, but I can detect none of that. Maybe this is why you get you when you weed out all the rebels with drug tests and personality surveys. A uniformly servile and dentured workforce, content to dream of the distant day when they'll be vested in the company's profit-sharing plan. They even join in the Walmart cheer when required to do so at meetings. I'm told by the evening fitting room lady, though I am fortunate enough never to witness this final abasement. But if it's hard to think out of the box, it may be almost impossible to think out of the big box. Walmart, when you're in it, is total. A closed system, a world unto itself. I get a chill when I'm watching TV in the break room one afternoon and see a, a commercial for Walmart. When a Walmart shows up within a television within a Walmart, you have to question the existence of an outer world. Sure, you can drive for five minutes and get somewhere else, to Kmart, that is, or Home Depot, or Target, or Burger King, or Wendy's, or KFC. Wherever you look, there is no alternative to the mega-scale corporate order, from which every form of local creativity and initiative has been abolished by distant home offices. Even the woods and the meadows have been stripped of disorderly life forms and forced into a uniform made of concrete. What you see highways, parking lots, stores, is all there is, or all that's left to us here in the reign of globalized, totalized, paved over, corporatized everything. 
I like to read the labels to find out where the clothing we sell is made. Indonesia, Mexico, Turkey, the Philippines, South Korea, Sri Lanka, Brazil. But the labels serve only to remind me that none of these places is exotic anymore. That they've all been eaten by the great blind profit-making global machine. The only thing to do is ask, why do you, why do we work here? Why do you stay? So when Isabel praises my work a second time, I take the opportunity to say I really appreciate her encouragement, but I can't afford to live on $7 an hour. And how does she do it? The answer is that she lives with her grown daughter, who also works. Plus the fact that she's worked here two years, during which her pay has shot up to seven seventy-five an hour. She counsels patience. It could happen to me. Melissa, who has the advantage of a working husband, says, Well, it's a job. Yes, she made twice as much when she was a waitress, but that place closed down, and at her age, she's never going to be hired at a high-tip place. I recognize the inertia, the unwillingness to start up with the apps and the interviews and the drug tests again. She thinks she should give it a year. A year? I tell her I'm wondering whether I should give it another week. Then something happens, not to me, and not at Walmart, but with dazzling implications nonetheless. It's a banner headline in the Star Tribune. 1,450 hotel workers, members of the Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees Union, strike nine local hotels. A business writer in the Pioneer Press commenting on this plus a Teamsters strike at the Pepsi-Cola bottling plant and a March Bay workers demanding union recognition at a St. Paul meat packing plant, rubs his eyes and asks, What's going on here? When I arrived for work that day, I salvaged the newspaper from the trash can just so outside the store entrance, which isn't difficult because the trash can is always overflowing as usual, and I don't have to dig down very far. Then I march that newspaper back to the break room, where I leave it face up on a table, in case anyone's missed the headline. This new role, bearer of really big news, makes me feel busy and important. At ladies, I relate the news to Melissa, adding that the hotel workers already earn over a dollar an hour more than we do, and that that hasn't stopped them from striking for more. She blinks a few times, considering. Then Isabel comes up and announces that the regional manager will be visiting our store tomorrow. So everything has to be zoned to the nth degree. The day is upon us. Back in the store with the numbers in my vest pocket, I decide to steal a few more minutes and maybe my calls on company time from the payphone near your layaway. The first motel doesn't answer, which is not uncommon in your low-rate places. On a whim, I call Caroline to see if she's on strike. No, not her hotel. But she laughs as she tells me that last night on the TV news, she saw a manager from the hotel where she used to work. He's a white guy who enjoyed reminding her that she was the first African-American to be hired for anything above a housekeeping job. And here he was on TV, reduced to pushing a broom while the regular broom pushers walked the picket line. I'm dialing the second motel when Howard repairs. Why aren't I at the computer? He wants to know, giving me his sigh nature hate smile. Break, I say, flashing him what is known to primatologists as a fear grin half teeth bearing and half grimace. If you're going to steal, you better be prepared to lie. He can find out in a minute, of course, by checking to see if I'm actually punched out. I could be written up, banished to bras, called in for a talking to by a deeply disappointed Roberta. But the second hotel has no room for another few days, which means that, for purely financial reasons, my career at Walmart is about to come to a sudden end anyway. When Melissa is getting ready to leave work at six, I tell her I'm quitting, possibly the next day. Well then, she thinks she'll be going too, because she doesn't want to work here without me. We both look at the floor. I understand that this is not a confession of love, just a practical consideration. You don't want to work with people who can't hold up their end, or whom you don't like being with, and you don't want to keep readjusting to new ones. We exchange addresses, including my real and permanent one. I tell her about the book I'm working on, and she nods. 
not particularly surprised, and says she hopes she hasn't said too many bad things about Walmart. I assure her that she hasn't, and that she'll be well disguised anyway. Then she tells me she's been thinking about it, and seven dollars an hour isn't enough for how hard we work after all, and she's going to apply at a plastics factory where she hopes she can get nine dollars an hour. At ten that night, I go to the break room for my final break, two foot sure to walk out to the smoking area and sit down with my feet up on the bench. My earlier break, the one I'd committed so many crimes to preserve, had been a complete bust with no other human around but a management level woman from accounting. I have that late shift shut in feeling that there's no world beyond the doors, no problem greater than the mystery items remaining at the bottom of my cart. There's only one other person in the break room anyway, a white woman of maybe 30 watching TV and I don't have the energy to start a conversation even with the rich topic of the strike at hand. And then, by the grace of God who dictated the Sermon on the Mount to Jesus, who watches over Melissa and sparrows everywhere, the TV picks up on the local news, and the news is about the strike. A picketer with a little boy tells the camera, This is for my son. I'm doing this for my son. Senator Paul Walston is standing there too. He shakes the boy's hand and says, you should be proud of your father. At this, my soul companion jumps up, grinning and waves a fist in the air at the TV set. I give her the rapid two index fingers pointing down signals that means, here, us, we could do that. She bounds over to where I'm sitting. If I were feeling peppier, I would have gone over to her. Leans into my face and says, damn right. I don't know whether it's my feet or the fact that she said damn, or what, but I find myself tearing up. She talks well past my legal break time and possibly hers, about her daughter, how she's sick of working long hours and never getting enough time with her, and what does this lead to anyway, when you can't make enough to save. I still think we could have done something, she and I, if I could have afforded to work at Walmart a little longer. <laughs>